Hello, everybody. Um, we would like to welcome you to Troubling Anniversaries, um, the annual conference of the Centre for Public History here at Queen's University, Belfast. This year, it's run in collaboration with the Institute for Historical Research. The Centre for Public History is now in its fifth year and um, has gone from strength to strength, building partnerships from within academia and beyond and fostering a wide range of collaborative research. We're absolutely delighted this year to be partner partnering with the um, Institute for Historical Research. This year, it marks its 100th anniversary and we're particularly um, remarkable that we can actually join together in this discussion. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Claire Langenberg because I'm losing my voice. Claire, you're the director of the Institute and we're delighted to have you here with us. Thank you. Thanks, Alwyn, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am the director of the Institute of Historical Research, but I have only just taken on that role. I started on the 1st of October, so I am still practicing saying my title out loud um, and enjoying it immensely, I have to say. Uh, my colleagues are spectacularly good. Um, it's an absolute pleasure as one of my early um, uh, duties, that's really the wrong word for it, as director, um, to be able to um, chair the first session um, in this wonderful conference, um, a conference that really speaks to the power of collaborative endeavour. Um, and like all great collaborations, I think we all um, hope and actually anticipate um, that the conference will generate something much more um, than the sum of its parts um, as we critically engage with the use of anniversaries in historical research and in a public interpretation. Um, and I'm particularly looking forward to ways of thinking about how we deal with contested pasts. Um, the conference is, um, it speaks to and is part of um, our commitment to collaboration throughout our centenary um, and is one of a series of events that are designed to reflect on the practice of history today, but also to think about um, how it might develop in the future. Um, we're using the hashtag, as everybody has to have a hashtag, um, hashtag our century, um, to really think about the ways in which we can help to draw together the historically minded wherever they're located and whatever their focus is or whatever their approach is. I think probably most of us would agree that these are somewhat challenging times for historians, um, whether we're located in universities, whether we're located within public policy and schools, or whether we're located in museums, archives and libraries. And we're really committed at the Institute to using the centenary to build relationships across sectors, um, to support inclusive communities of scholarship and debate and to really strengthen um, through partnership and collaboration, um, the world of the historically minded. Um, so with this in mind, please, um, as an audience, as participants in this event, please do feel free to share your experiences um, with the um, various forms of social media that are available to us. Um, our hashtags for the event are hashtag our century and hashtag troubling anniversaries. Okay, so I'd like to welcome all of the speakers um, and we're going to take them um, in the order that they're in the program. So our first speaker, Katerina, Lariccio is the anniversary director of the Mayflower 400 um, project in Southampton. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Katerina. Thank you so much, Claire. And thank you for asking um, me to join you. I am not the, the anniversary director anymore because thankfully it has finally finished. It, it did go on for um, a long time. So the, the things in the way of showing the first slide, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Zoom bars in the way of the view panel. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. You can see the, can you see the slide panel as well? That's the problem, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm -hmm. Don't know how to move this thing. If you, you go towards the bottom of the screen where there's a zoom in, zoom out bar. 
It's usually the view thing. Yeah. There we go. That's it. Found it. Right. Thank you so much. So, yes, I was the anniversary director of Southampton's Mayflower 400, which became also its 401 because of the pandemic, of course, the anniversary <laughs> extended. And at one point we thought it would never end, but it has now. So I, I'm no longer in that post. I'm a freelancer. So, um, which explains quite a lot. And I'm certainly not a historian. So I'm, I'm apologies for all the historians in the room, which know a lot more about this history than I do. But I'm here to kind of talk about creative approaches. I wasn't there when Southampton started doing the anniversary project because um, someone else was in post, basically. And uh, I, I can only guess really why Southampton thought it was a good idea. And that's probably because half of Southampton is called after the Mayflower, so Mayflower Theatre, Mayflower School, etc. Um, they're working towards the City of Culture bid, so we're looking for key milestones around that. And we're luckily short one of the long list shortlists. And um, also, there was part of a national programme, and it was envisaged at that point that there would be value coming into the city through national resources. Um, as it pans out, that didn't really happen at all, and, and the national resource is very much Plymouth focus. Um, and in a way, that was a bit frustrating because we didn't get the value we thought we were going to get, but in a way that gave us freedom because the Plymouth approach wasn't one that I was particularly bought into. So my background um, as, oh, now it won't go forward. There we go. My background is uh, creative directing festivals and outdoor arts, basically. Um, so that's my real so street theatre, jugglers, circus. So coming into history was um, it was something I was very interested in. And I first came into it via working on the Olympics. So I was one of the programmers for London 2012. And of course, through that, worked with the museums and heritage sector quite closely. And that really sparked my interest and went from there into working at the Houses of Parliament with um, Queen's very own Lord Paul Bew was my was one of my chairmen, so that was a delight. But when I was at Parliament, I had to deliver the Magna Carta 800. And it became quite, well, it just felt very instinctively natural for me not to just focus on the Magna Carta 800 because our ambitions there was to improve democratic engagement. And I didn't think the Magna Carta was a particularly useful tool for exciting people about parliamentary democracy. So what we did instead was look at rights and representations and and we found 18 key moments through the whole 800 years to celebrate and that in a way opened up the anniversary to a whole lot of other stories which people could tap into so abolition suffragettes you can see here the Putney debates the chartists so we've just provided avenues for lots of different people to get involved in the anniversary so I had had that history when I was asked to come and do the Mayflower 400. I inherited the role from an American and as you can imagine, he probably had a very different view to Mayflower 400 than myself. And I had to think long and hard why I would do it and if it was the right thing to do, really. And I kind of decided it was because I mentor a young refugee, an unaccompanied child refugee. And at the time, it's February 2019, there was lots of stuff on the news about refugees in the English Channel. And I thought if the anniversary could do one good thing, it could look at why people got on boats, why people get on ships, why people leave families behind. And what they leave behind when they do that. So that was my real starting point. And luckily, the team I worked with, which at the time was the Southampton Cultural Development Trust, uh, kind of agreed to go with me. So there was a complete shift. They'd been working for 18 months, two years in one direction and agreed completely to change direction. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And um, it did mean we inherited a particular sort of steering committee. So I had some of the real local historian old guards who are the over my dead body brigade which we had to deal with and poor Emmeline who worked with me, Emmeline Hickman is an absolute delight she got a lot of abuse at certain meetings from some people who didn't like the change in direction uh, we were told it would be boring we would be told people didn't care about the contested history that it wouldn't be understood um, but we were really determined to stick to it and one of the reasons I was really determined was because at the very first meeting I went to in that role was with the City College and at that point they told me that 100% of their prevent money was spent on far-right extremism and I thought well if ever a city needed to have a program which challenged some of those stories around migration it was Southampton. It's a, it's a really multicultural city but doesn't view itself in that way. So yeah we, we lost some sponsorship money as a consequence of changing the program, uh, we lost some support, some people we thought were friends and some enthusiasm, uh, but we kept going. And actually, as you'll see from some of these stats on the slides, it was 
an absolute triumph in the end. We're, we're absolutely thrilled, 68,000 people engaging in the programme, which considering it was delivered during the pandemic um, was even more <laughs> impressive. So we did really, really well. It was an absolute rush to get it started. Some of the stuff we inherited was amazing. So you'll see this picture was the music club. So they had a thousand school children um, singing a very joyous um, celebration of the Mayflower. So this is something I necessarily would not have part as part of the programme. But obviously I wasn't going to cancel all this fantastic work that was already happening. And uh, so it was a mix. You know, we did the, the traditional tree planting and, and looking at the monument. But actually what we really tried to do is look at some really key themes or what could be useful. And our ultimate key theme really was about empathy. Um, so all of our programme really was just trying to develop cultural understanding to give people who didn't normally have a voice in Southampton that voice to reveal all the many hidden histories that were in the city and through the lens of migration, refuge or sanctuary. So Southampton is a city of sanctuary and that's really important to them. Um, so one of the projects we did, we, we delivered this in various ways. So we commissioned um, the Empathy Museum, who have this great show called A Mile In My Shoes. You literally, you put on someone else's shoes and headphones and you walk a mile listening to their story. So it looks like a giant shoe box and you go and you pick a pair of shoes your size and you don't know who you're going to get. And we did that and we encouraged, uh, we sponsored eight people from Southampton to be part of it. So this is the fantastic Dahlia Jamil who is the chair of Arts Asia. And everyone was expecting her, of course, to talk about Art Asia, but what she talked about was her efforts around uh, women's liberation and feminism and her work that she'd done in that area. So that was really fantastic. And we had the director of Black History Month, but we also had Professor Todd Wilkinson who was leading the COVID drug trials at the time. So really trying to give that story of Southampton through individual stories. And while it was quite a small turnout on the actual at the event because of COVID, Consequently, 6,000 people have heard those stories of Southampton, which is fantastic. So this is our Asia's work. And this is a, this is a project that was deeply impacted by COVID because they were supposed to be doing a dance project for the Mela. And in the end, they decided to do an installation project instead, which asked people, what does belonging mean to you? And they had poetry commissions, art commissions, a song. Go online and listen to that song. It's the most beautiful thing. So really, they had over a thousand people joined in online with that project talking about what home and belonging means to them. And also some of the people in their home countries also joined in. So in one of our final presentations, we had young people in Dubai and India joining in, it was fantastic. It's really important that we got the community to tell their stories. Obviously I didn't want to tell anybody's story for them. Um, we didn't have a huge budget. Uh, so we did a community grants program. It's a new scheme the Heritage Lottery have got where you can actually apply to mon for money to give out. And we had £60,000 of mixture of Southampton City Council money and heritage grants. And we supported 21 community groups to tell their stories. And we gave them our key objectives around hidden histories, migration, all those things. And we have got a fantastic range of stories. Um, some of the ones that are featured here, which the Southampton hip hop heritage has become huge. It's now a really massive project in the city and is going to go on to get its own funding. And a lovely set of booklets and a walking tour around Muslim seafarers who were buried in the cemetery in Southampton because of course they had to be buried as soon as they landed on land so really huge number of rituals around Muslim seafarers being buried in the city and out of that we found the fantastic Professor Tony Cushion who actually Tom Holm at Queen's had recommended we look at and he was an absolute gem of a man that what he doesn't know about the city is is not worth knowing and he was absolutely fantastic. And, and through here, we made a series of films which really explored those hidden stories of Southampton, which had never been told before. So you see him outside Southampton City Airport here, but that's actually a story about a transmigration camp because that's what the airport was originally. So all these hidden stories people didn't know about the black GIs being in Southampton. And also we worked with Dr. Nazneen Ahmed, who you see here, she did the Muslim uh, sailor story that I was telling you about. She made a film about that and we blurred History Month as well, telling their story. So in all, there were 10 films and we put those as part of our education resource as well. Another way we got hidden stories was to do oral histories, to work with the oral histories that were in the archive, but also to bring that up to date with stories of more recent migrations. And we used those creatively. So our biggest piece was this song called Voyages of the Heart. It was a two and a half hour concert with 25 musicians. All the songs are inspired by oral histories of people who have come to or through Southampton. So there was reggae, soul, Irish folk, phenomenal. 
of course, one of the really difficult areas around Southampton and Mayflower is the Native Americans. Uh, we worked really closely with the Wampanoag tribes. So we had this fantastic exhibition. They co-wrote our uh, education resource. So it was the first ever schools resource written from a Native American and European perspective. We made a whole series of films with them because they couldn't come over looking at what they do on Thanksgiving, et cetera. And we also, which I'm really most delighted with is this plaque. So we did spend a lot of money renovating the Mayflower Memorial. And I absolutely think that was the right thing to do. You know, if we couldn't have a Mayflower anniversary with this dilapidated memorial, but we put two new plaques on it as part of this year. One of them was for the Wampanoag people. And one of them was just to mark all the people of Southampton who'd come to or through the city in search of a new life. So just really repositioning the monument of our story of, of migration. Um, in terms of other communities we worked with, we really wanted to make sure everyone was included. So this is work we did with deaf and disabled artists. So we did CPD workshops with them as well as commissioning artists. This was a project we supported with Muslim female artists about really making sure that they had visibility within the city. And we also wanted to work with some of our isolated estates. So this piece is called Towers of Light. Um, in the end, 125, nearly all of those seafaring flats put nautical flags in their windows. So we put messages out to sea from Southampton. So it was just a way of trying to get people who didn't necessarily identify with that migration story to look at their relationship with the sea and Southampton being a port. And then finally, as I say, thank you to you for listening. Um, we had a big piece originally, it was supposed to be about people having dinner with their neighbours. So instead of Thanksgiving, we were doing giving thanks. And the idea, that was going to be our street parties, our picnics, the go and have supper and learn about people through their food. Of course, we couldn't do that with the pandemic. But in the end, it became a bit more thanksgiving -y than we expected. But we asked people to send in photos, images, poems, stories of what they were grateful for. And it's actually turned into the most beautiful little slice of history around the pandemic because it was it was made in November and December last year. So actually people really reflecting on what things they were grateful for during the pandemic. It's very, very lovely. So the themes were, were there, but open enough for everyone to join in, really, I guess. And that's a really whistle stop. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. That is just an astonishing project and 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 so just multi-stranded but absolutely coherent and I love the idea of the the empathy museum um it's but every aspect of it thank you for sharing that with us um we're next going to move on to Stephen Stephen Franklin um, who is at Royal Holloway and is going to talk on the Magna Carta Stephen cool yeah just let me do the old sharing of the screen right um, da, da, da. you would have thought that i would have been you can always say that right so um yeah thank you very much for the invitation um i fear that uh, katarina is as much an expert on, on this as i am um so yeah i'm just gonna provide a few brief uh, reflections on you know some of my own input and involvement in Magna Carta commemorative activities, but also sort of my take on it as somebody that was at the same time writing a PhD about the history of commemoration of Magna Carta, um, you know, and, and trying to trying to uh, square that circle or, you know, um, around the corners of the square, etc. Um, so obviously the ceiling of Magna Carta 1215, uh, and I'm acutely aware that there are medievalists in the room. Um, so if I do make any 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 major hashes, then please do feel free to uh, berate me in the comments. Um, ceiling of Magna Carta, obviously uh, an iconic moment in uh, in English history. Um, there is a temptation to say British history, but it is very much a, an English moment. Um, and anybody with any Scottish ancestry would tell you tell you as such. Um, Obviously, I think as a general comment, um, in terms of commemoration, uh, it is quite rare for a for a medieval document to have such a such a, a long um, and enduring presence um, that still kind of exerts some form of cultural resonance in the modern day. Um, so, in that sense, uh, the commemoration of Magna Carta is kind of a a non it was kind of a non a non negotiable. It was always going to take place. Um, and I think really the issue or 
a thing, of, uh, an interesting thing about the commemoration of uh, Magna Carta is actually there's this relationship between Magna Carta, the event, i.e. the sealing moment in um, Runnymede in 1215, where King John is sat down by the barons, um, and the kind of drama and the performative uh, ramifications of what that meant, i.e. bringing the king to account, uh, the good barons being the protectors of uh, some form of liberty. Uh, that is also very much up for argument and debate, but that, that is what that kind of the, the hackneyed Victorian uh, account um, kind of leads us to, to believe. Um, and then also you have the very physical artifactual history of the document. Um, so Helen Cam here speaking in 1965, kind of talks about this relationship and actually it is both event and document and, and the commemoration of it is kind of the fusion of both. Um, so sort of building on this idea, you know, Justin Champion or, um, in 2015 uh, sort of coined this term of commemorating a series of Magna Carta moments, i.e., you know, the history of Magna Carta endures for 800 years and, you know, whether it's Sir Edward Cook on the left hand side um, using or invoking uh, Magna Carta to help him to help eventually uh, dethrone Charles I and, and, and lead to his execution, or whether it's Arthur Beardmore, um, you know, being pictured or being painted here, teaching his son uh, about Magna Carta, just as he's about to get, be arrested uh, for, uh, um, for publishing slanderous um, articles about the Princess Dowager, um, or even, you know, whether it's 1965 and the Mangrove Nine, um, there is a series of Magna Carta moments that, that kind of are also being commemorated at the same time. So I think generally the challenges of 2015 can be summarised, and this is by no means in its totality, but one challenge is how do you go about pulling this very long, very varied and also very nuanced history together in a way that is consumable and makes sense, um, that is also engaging. Um, I think there's also um, the the issue of producing commemorative events and programs or activities in an era of heritage tourism. You know, it needs to, it doesn't need to, but there is an expectation that that it will sell, that it's marketable. Um, and especially in 2015, you know, there was the background of an economic slump, so money was scarce, especially for sort of more cultural activity. Um, and then practicality, you know, the logistics of coordinating an event that of an international, national, regional, local level, alongside, you know, the importance of balance and stakeholder management. It, it, Magna Carta was, you know, is, uh, important within the academic community, the legal sphere, Americans, um, Commonwealth countries also lay claim. Um, so there's that as well. Um, and then also you have the issue of commemorating an event that, you know, is arguably quite anti-monarchical in nature. Um, so actually what problems does that pose um, in terms of the way that commemorative activity and, you know, performative ritualistic uh, ceremony and grandeur is kind of imbued uh, into into these moments of uh, celebration. Um, so the Magna Carta Trust uh, was kind of key focal to um, to coordinating these events. Uh, it, it, and here we have a screenshot from their uh, their website. Uh, so Robert Worcester was the chairman of the trust, the uh, chairman of the uh, anniversary committee, um, famous for uh, being the kind of been charge of Ipsos Mori, the political polling people. Um, and sort of they kick off their five year program anniversary events in 20, 2010 with a high profile launch at Runnymede featuring the likes of uh, Ken Clark and um, Lord Noberger, who was at the time um, kind of the in charge of the Supreme Court. Um, you know, and he's the uh, trust uh, committee are kind of overseeing a, a massive um, board of representatives uh, advisory board um, containing you know the academic community legal community cultural institutions so forth Stephen can I just inspect would you be able to just sort of um scroll down to the slides it's just that the slides aren't scrolling for the audience so, oh okay sorry you know. sorry um, right so here I am here brilliant. I am just, thank just you that. right okay in which case um so 
what what happened so there were varieties of exhibitions in the top right you have the british library it was uh, law liberty legacy their biggest um, exhibition to date most popular um you also had uh, jay-z turning up at uh, salisbury cathedral um just to ensure that brand magna carta was um was very much in people's in the forefront of people's mind um but i would just like to talk about my involvement in this on the bottom right um in you know little egger museums pop-up exhibition um it held in the local united reform church so egger museum uh, at the time ran on a budget of two thousand pounds to have a cost basically it didn't have a full-time curator um but had seen because of its kind of relate uh, local connection to runnymede uh, an opportunity to you know in, enlarge its reputation and program of events so it put together a hundred thousand pound or ninety eight thousand pounds heritage lottery uh, funded project to ensure that there was a, a wealth of events uh, pop-up exhibition being one um, outreach activities with local schools um, and and uh, volunteer vol voluntary groups in the area um, and the kind of jewel in the crown and was was the exhibition which ran for three months uh, one of the challenges of course was that Egger museum unlike the british library does not have a copy of the magna carta so how do you curate an exhibition where you're kind of the elephant in the room is, is missing you know um so you know we we tried our best to create content um source content from local community groups that could then be accessioned uh, into the collection and form the basis of future um future commemorative uh, activities so our local running mood local art society for one were asked to provide or produce artwork um, that was inspired by the themes of magna carta and its legacies uh, another activity that i was involved with at royal holloway um, was the production of a magna carta mooc a mooc being a massive open online course um, it was a six long six week long course um that launched in 2015 uh, and over it the two iterations in 2015 received 25,000 enrollments or there were thereabouts um and this was quite a challenge in two capacities one in 2015 i don't think we were as nimble as operating in the digital world as we are today um the second issue was well, how do you actually begin to to contain this very large expansive history into six weeks um, and also how do you talk about the later interpretations of magna carta um, in a way that that doesn't just keep on kind of hark, harking back to oh yeah well you know th there was this there was this kind of yeah magna carta kind of believe means this to this group of people i.e how do you begin to explain you know how the the power and idea of magna carta has has gone on to um to uh to to kind of exercise people in their beliefs and and provoke judgment and action um and then at runnymede um on the actual event itself uh, uh, monday the 15th 2015 um we had lawyers, uh, we had um, American lawyers, bottom right down at Runnymede, rededicating the memorial. Um, you have this kind of weird image here of the stripes of the red arrows above the American Bar Association monument at Runnymede. And that kind of cross between American and uh, or Anglo-American relations is very, very strong and powerful there. Um, top right image here, um, it makes me laugh every time the fact that Runnymede actually had to change their their sign from the birthplace of modern democracy. It now reads the place of politics and picnics. I'm sure King John is rolling in his grave at that. Um, and then on the left hand side, you had Hugh Locke's um, Jurors installation being unveiled, um, which provided a very whole um, and complete uh, look at rights and evolution in in the fullest sense so not just thinking about magna carta but using magna carta as a way to look at the way in which environmental rights have developed the way in which legal rights have developed um the way in which uh, slave um slave uh in which magna carta and and rights have kind of uh, spoken to ideas of slavery um and independence from around the world um 
And then lastly, just a few final thoughts. So I think what I'm trying to say uh, in trying to bring this all together is that one of the key issues, uh, whether you were at a very large institution or a very small institution, was that commemorations of Magna Carta you know, really show that there is a difficulty in capturing the essence of an idea. How do you, how do you explain to people why people acted the way they did if those people don't necessarily uh, believe or understand or um, the, the, have the same kind of worldview? And, and then I also think that whilst there was, you know, talk of, um, whilst there was kind of interaction with themes of slavery um, and uh, less, uh, I'm going to say sexy, um, but less well-known elements, there was, by and large, a very darker side of Magna Carta that was kind of neglected, um, you know, unsurprisingly this commemorative moment was not used as a as a as the as a moment to to say that actually you know magna carta was as much used as a as a weapon uh, to to take civil rights away from from countries during um, the 18th and 19th centuries um and the interesting thing for me is that hugh Locke's jurors installation is probably one of the only uh physical um kind of memorials or installations that actually brings this idea to the foreground and allows people to to um to interact and engage with this um so that is enough of me i think i've just about done 10 minutes and apologies for the uh, for the technical difficulties that's brilliant thank you so much and um that's that's a lot of enrollment for that MOOC, and I'm sure lots of people will want to ask questions about that um, later on. Um, so thank you, Stephen. Um, so the next presentation is going to be Keith Lilly, um, Director of the Living Legacies Centre at Queen's and talking about First World War Living Legacies. Um, thank you, Keith. Thanks, uh, thanks ever so much, uh, Claire, that, that's great. And uh, really interesting uh, conversation so far. So I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, discussion especially uh, today, uh, uh, an auspicious day <laughs> with what's going on in this part of the world in Armagh um, and the centenary service in Armagh, which we marked upon earlier on. I'm just going to share my screen now, hopefully it will work beautifully. Okay, so hopefully that's visible to everybody. Good, <laughs> thanks. Okay, yes, um, so I, um, for, well, five or six years uh, in total in the end, um, directed the Living Legacies Public Engagement Centre based at Queen's University Belfast, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to be able to say a few words about the, uh, the work we did at Living Legacies. So I think it fits very well with this topic of troubled anniversaries and troubling anniversaries, kind of questioning anniversaries, thinking somewhat more critically about the past and how the past lives on in the present and how it shapes our futures. And our strap line for Living Legacies as a, a public engagement centre was from past conflict um, to shared future, recognising how sometimes difficult pasts, um, not only do they need to be confronted and explored, but for how difficult pasts can also be used um, to create bridges, to make connections, to connect communities, to, to share the past and to look um, to maybe reconcile some of those difficulties. Um, and of course, today is, is an important day in that particular context in this part of the world. And of course, we'll hear more, I'm sure, in due course and beyond 2022. Um, so in Northern Ireland, of course, you know, the past is all around us. I'm sure that we can say that wherever we may be. Um, but I wanted to start off with just a point about anniversaries, really. Just a, it's an obvious point, but I think it's worth saying that no anniversary is the same. Um, and I think already it's been quite interesting because Katrina was really focusing on one year and one city. And Stephen was on talking about one year and in effect one nation, I suppose, sort of thinking about the English context. Um, with the First World War, the, the thing about the First World War, the centenary of World War I is not one anniversary, of course, 
it's not one anniversary, it's actually many anniversaries uh, between 1914 and 1918, uh, and many different kind of ways of commemorating that period in different parts of the world, not just in the area I'm in at the moment. Although in the area I am in at the moment, um, the First World War was actually fitted into, and it still fits into uh, what's called a decade of centenaries or decade of anniversaries in Northern Ireland, which is a program overseen by the Community Relations Council in Northern Ireland, working in partnership with organizations like the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And that actually covers the period 2012 through to 2022. So we're not there yet, folks. Uh, we've got another year to go. <laughs> So the, the living legacy is the point here, living legacies as a public engagement center sort of sits within that kind of wider landscape of anniversaries and centenaries uh, within this part of the world. And uh, that in itself poses quite a few challenges, not only just thinking about the breadth of those anniversaries, and you can see the dates on the first slide here, uh, ranging across the first World War and its centenaries. Um, so so not, not just thinking about the dates, but also the places as well. I think about where commemoration, how we remember and where, and why that's important. And it's something that Stephen was just talking about in relation to Runnymede. Um, so there's lots of complexities here, I think, for us to begin to tease out um, through looking at how the past relates to the present. So in my short presentation, what I want to do is just say a few words, if I may, about um, Living Legacies as a public engagement centre um, and some of the work we did uh, over that five-year period and to tease out some of the ways in which we explored um, complex heritage in the context of um, a divided society. So um, Living Legacies then, uh, as I said, was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and uh, based uh, where I'm based at Queen's University, Belfast. It was principally about connecting communities and sharing heritage. That was really our kind of main role uh, a main purpose, connecting communities and sharing heritage around the First World War. But we also were very keen to tap into community expertise, recognizing that around these islands, there's a huge amount of grassroots and community expert expertise, let's use that word, uh, knowledge and expertise, which, uh, and around the First World War, this was, of course, but in other aspects as well, I'm sure we can all think of examples, a lot of interest at the grassroots level and uh, what Living Legacies was trying to do was tap into that community expertise and to bring it into dialogue with um, the academic sector, but not in the heritage sector more broadly, museums, libraries, archives, archeology, span and uh, the university sector, um, to make connections between the kind of academic research skills, if you like, and those uh, community interests at the grassroots level. So it was that kind of dialogue we were interested in exploring. So building bridges was very much about a, a part of what we were about, really. The wider context then briefly um, for the um, Living Legacies Engagement Centre was a programme of funding um, created by the Arts and Humanities Research Council working in collaboration with the National Lottery Heritage Fund back in 2013, this was. And a call went out for what it was called then Coordinating Centres for Community Research and Engagement. And the idea principally was to use the university sector to help um, engage with the National Lottery Heritage Fund or HLF funded community projects on the First World War, which were about to uh, be uh, undertaken across the four nations. Um, so uh, the funding was um, given in the end to five engagement centers and I was the head of one of those uh, living legacies. The other four engagement centers, I like to say this were all in England, and uh, mainly uh, actually south of, uh, south of the Midlands. Um, so North Living Legacy is being situated in Northern Ireland was somewhat out on a limb, but uh, that was uh, not a problem as far as we were concerned at all. We were, saw ourselves very much from the start as part of uh, a wider kind of set of issues recognized at higher policy government levels around the challenges of the centenary of World War I uh, on the island of Ireland in Northern Ireland. Um, as that little quotation from DCMS says there, um, and wondering about how we might begin to engage uh, with communities to look at the complexities of World War I um, in collaboration and, and in partnership with different organizations, but especially with community organizations to build those kinds of bridges and recognize the differences and, and interests that we have. 
So we saw very much the World War I centenary, not you know, as a challenge, but also as an opportunity as well. Um, so one of those opportunities really was to drill down for us as researchers, to drill down into the complexities of commemoration um, at the local level and recognizing that you know, commemoration is not um, the same everywhere, that geography matters and clearly for us in this part of the world, 1916 was going to be really important and pivotal year um, with the Easter Rising uh, centenary as well as the Battle of the Somme and how that played out within local communities, not just in Belfast, as you can see on the map uh, across the community vibe, but more widely as well on the island here. Um, so uh, and we tapped into the kind of work done by Richard Grayson, who's one of our co-investigators. We actually had nine co-investigators on Living Legacies. It was quite a big project, really. Um, so his expertise uh, as an historian, uh, talking about history from the street, um, and his book, Belfast Boys, and, you know, recognition that actually, you know, taking the Battle of the Somme, for example, you know, there were stories from both sides of the community, and we wanted to try and ensure that, you know, engaging with the St. Union of World War I was going to be one which spoke across the uh, community by, and was a way of kind of sharing stories. Um, um, between uh, nationalists and uh, loyalists. So uh, our kind of um, set of, um, I suppose, principles here really is to, is Living Legacies was really not about history, really. It was more about heritage. We were interested in how the past lives on in the present. Um, we recognize the past is not dead, um, particularly in this part of the world, it's very clear that it's very much alive. Um, and we wanted to actually, as much as sort of put the focus and the spotlight on the here and the now, rather than a sort of historian's spotlight looking at 19 for the sake of looking at 19, uh, 1916 for the sake of looking at 1916 or whatever it may be. Um, so thinking about how the war lives on in the 21st century to develop diverse, inclusive narratives, you know, basically, as I said at the start, putting community communities together, sharing and connecting communities, sharing heritage and tapping community expertise and to think about how past conflict can be used to create a shared future. That was our kind of purpose really. And I mentioned the National Lottery Heritage Fund. First of all, first of all then and now was a very important program um, for supporting community projects. And we were very keen, and I know the NLHF were very keen for us to work in uh, close collaboration with those projects, which is what we did. Uh, across the across the four nations. Um, some principles again here, these are the kinds of things that we thought were important, um, co-production, sharing, um, providing a deeper analysis, working in partnership with different organizations is absolutely, absolutely fundamental and critical to what we were doing. And also identify particular themes, um, including creative practice um, and performing Performing arts, that's very much an important strand of what we did. Um, looking at archaeology and landscapes, material culture, museums, um, looking at digitization and digital engagement as well. So those are the kind of areas we were particularly interested in exploring with communities um, across the centenary of the First World War. And then putting this together as on a legacy website as well, um, so that this can be engaged with. So sharing that heritage. Very briefly, let me just say, these are the range of kinds of approaches we undertook through Living Legacies. I have to say more about this in due course, I realize time is against me. Um, and just three different projects really to exemplify those very briefly. Uh, one thing which I thought was really important, especially on the island here, was to kind of move away from the Western Front narratives around commemorating the First World War and to diversify the centenary by looking, for example, at the impacts of aviation and aviation heritage on the island of Ireland. And we did a project funded by National Lottery Heritage Fund on a warship station um, uh, just uh, in County Antrim here using survey methods, using archeological methods. Um, so, and then another project which is really important with, uh, you'll, you'll hear shortly, I'm sure from the National Museum of Northern Ireland, we worked very closely with NMNI uh, on a project called it Remembering 1916 and specifically drawing out from community um, uh, public engagement, uh, roadshows, um, artifact biographies, stories about particular family heirlooms uh, from all sides of the community here, and then curating those. Fiona Byrne was fantastic as a curator at the, at the Ulster Museum, 
putting this, this material together in the galleries there, which you can see pictures of. And thirdly, um, this is an important project as well, because again, it was very much a cross community um, piece of work with um, Down County Museum and Mike King was instrumental here and a history and a hut uh, from, from Ballykinler camp and the camp itself in County Down, very interesting story behind it, but you know, it was used for internment, but it was also used for training soldiers who went off to the Somme. So again, really important local resonances there across the community divide. And bringing this all together, this is still actually ongoing now with the Community Relations Council, the toolkit for the decade of St. Tina's or decade of anniversaries it's called here. Um, so building in some of the learning from this exercise from, from living legacies um, in toolkits and so on. So, so this is not just, I think something we really need to be careful of in the university sector is that the funding is finite and therefore it's a tendency for the, for the project just to end, but we need to maintain that dialogue. It must continue. Uh, for all sorts of reasons and also to think about the wider issues here and as i just finish on this slide here thinking about uh, what this means in terms of heritage and how we engage with the past how we might perhaps promote a particular more inclusive way of dealing with the past that is called inclusive heritage discourse more bottom up, more, more grassroots more communal more, more uh, participatory as you can see there more diverse and i think that's where we are at at the moment we've moved away from that sort of top-down view the past. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I've gone slightly over time there, but I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Keith. And another fantastic project and really struck there with the um the absolute circle of co-production of work between the projects, those involved in the project um, as leaders of the project, but also museums and communities. Absolutely wonderful. Um, so our next and um, final presentation, but of course we have the discussion and questions to come, um, is um, Kieran Wallace from Trinity College Dublin um, and Zoe Reid from the National Archives of Ireland, um, who are going to be talking on Beyond 2022. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Claire. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, just to check that you can all see my slides there. And that's showing right. Um, it's been interesting to hear the other speakers presenting because there's so many similarities across. So the discussion, I think, should be very interesting. Our project, Beyond 2022, is funded for the, from the Dublin government, from the, the Irish government's uh, decade of centenaries. And our decade of centenaries actually is more than a decade. It's from 1912 to 1923. So we've got two more years to go. So I feel your pain, Keith. Um, the, uh, and in a way, you could nearly argue that our, our project is, in a sense, dodging the anniversary, or more productively, it's using the anniversary to open the door to deeper histories. So it's using the opportunity and the public interest and the funding, frankly, that comes with an anniversary to open a more complex debate. So um, the project itself, I'll just give you a very brief background on where it comes from, what we're doing. Zoe will talk then, and then I'll round up with a, a further update. And this is more a discussion of our actions on the project, what our project is composed of. So in 1867, after uh, centuries of very dodgy archival practice and record keeping practice, where lots of Irish records were lost and destroyed by fire, flood and vermin, um, in 1867, we got the Public Record Office of Ireland and the Public Record Act of Ireland, a purpose built building designed to be fireproof, designed to have a fire break in the buildings you see in the centre there, and it was built to hold all Irish records, they were all to be poured into this one building as the most secure place to hold Ireland's historical archive, going back seven centuries, going back to the Norman settlement in Ireland. Um, the uh, legislation was very important, it gave great power to the record keeper, and it followed on the English model from the 1830s. Here's the interior of the building itself, so you see the archivists working away in its 55 year history. It was very successful at doing what it was employed to do. It was a, a good news story. So you have archivists who are cataloging, who are calendaring, who are putting order on the archives that are pouring into their new repository. They're shelving, they're conserving, they're flattening, they're cleaning, they're binding, that they're making finding aids, and they're creating a really good scholarly working environment, both for administrators who need an archive, but also for historians who need an archive. I think the amount of historians actually exceeded what they anticipated using. So this was a great success story. And Ireland, the, the building that they created was called the Record Treasury. So Ireland really had a Record Treasury. They made, they called it the Treasury, and it, it acted in that way, preserving historical treasures. The 
troubling centenary that we're dealing with is the centenary that happened, uh, will happen on the 30th of June 2022. It's the 30th of June 1922, when in the opening engagement of the Irish Civil War, the record office, the public record office of Ireland was entirely destroyed. The Irish Civil War, for people not familiar, I won't do the full 12 week long seminar series on it, but basically two factions have different views of what the future of independent Ireland should look like. And the course of fighting with the future, they destroy seven centuries of the past in the in the intervening fight. Um, Keith's point about uh, uh, geography matters is very true. The problems of how to, how to commemorate the civil war and inter, an intra-Irish war is hugely problematic. But we're just focusing on the one launch date with the records where the history was destroyed. And that's the launch point for our project. So Zoe, I'll hand over to you now and uh, move on to the first slide on your section. Thanks, Kieran. So what I'm going to talk about is the aftermath and the recovery and bring us from 1922, 1923, right up to today. So immediately this disaster after it happened, um, there was an acknowledgement from parliament or from government at the time. So the Minister of Finance, who happened to be a Michael, Michael Collins, um, he um, visited the site on the 4th of July um, and uh, noted that it needed to be secured and the recovery um, from the remains needed to start happening pretty quickly. So they employed this gentleman, a guy called John Chandler Smith, and John had come from, he was an OPW engineer. He'd had experience of dealing with the customs house after the fire in the May of 1921 as a structural engineer and looking at that salvage operation. So they brought him on board for the four courts. Um, he was started working on the 13th of July and four days later, on the 17th of July, staff were admitted onto that site, a building site essentially, a site of rubble and ruins. Um, and they continued working until the 8th of June for almost uh, in 1923, so all, almost for 11 months, um, trying to go through the rubble and salvage material. Uh, next slide, Kieran. And what they did really when we start thinking about it is quite remarkable. They went into the building rubble and they identified records that they knew that they had worked with closely. And it must have been hugely traumatic. I, I say this quite a bit whenever I think about that recovery um, process that they did. They went in, they were given a room in the record office in Dublin Castle. They extracted lumps of stuff really whenever we see them today it was quite incredible um, and they took them to this room and they cleaned and identified them as best they could now they were aided very much by um the herbert woods publication which had been um a guide to the record office of ireland but also their own knowledge um in terms of what what they were looking at and they wrapped everything in brown paper uh, and string and put labels on it and parcels. Of course, these were archivists. These were people who knew the records. So of course there was a high level of um, organization to what they did. Thanks, Kieran. And then did that just move by itself? Sorry, that was my mistake. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trigger finger. <laughs> That's fine. So basically, um, and again, as Kieran mentioned, the staff had been engaged since the um, uh, late 1880s, probably in the repair and looking after their own records. Um, but it wasn't really documented other than in the deputy keepers reports. So today, what I have are the documents tell me the history of their repair and the work that was done. And you can see some examples of that here. When we started this project, it used to be they'd all these parcels and nobody really looked after them and nobody, well, nobody looked inside them really for 95 years. But that's strictly speaking, not true. Work was done, and we can see some examples of it here. From a conservative point of view, these are hugely fascinating because we're looking at historic and older um, methods of conservation. Um, and then, thanks, Kira. It is automated uh, to something happening that I'm not doing, so. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think it's these slides. Um, sorry, folks. So I won't go too much into that, but as I say, this is a, um, sort of investigative work that we're doing at the minute, looking back at these historic um, examples. I think we'll jump on to that next slide, Kira. So in 2017, um, with funding from the Irish Manuscripts Commission, uh, we were able to do a survey um, of the parcels that had remained unopened. And there were about 378 parcels. <gasps> and things were really wiggling backwards and forwards, unfortunately. So <laughs> it's, I can it's, just- It's a timer, so yeah, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Just leave it on the last one, Kieran, and it's fine. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, so the, the um, survey 
work uh, continue, um, happened in 2017. And what that was doing, it was a concentrated survey for 16 weeks. We were to look at um, the contents of those parcels. And from a conservator's point of view, we were to really kind of think about um, how we would tackle the conservation of them. Um, so we did that. Um, and that gave us a whole bank of knowledge. It began to build up our idea of how much had, and the quantity and the scale of what had been um, pulled out of the rubble. Um, and the slide before this one, um, if this, this one, is we can see an example of some of the early stages of conservation. These were 66 forms from 1798 from the Yeomanry collection. Um, they weren't in too bad condition. You can just see because they've been folded, there were central burn marks. Um, so these were sort of an easy win for me to conserve. You can see some of the, the techniques that I'm doing um, there. I'm introducing moisture and humidity into them and then I'm trying to find a good repair tissue. And a repair tissue from my point of view is one that will stabilize the damage, but still allow the text to be seen. Um, and so that's what we did. There's lots more conservation continuing to happen today. It's incredibly exciting, but I'll pass on to Kieran and let him talk about what the historians can do now with the conserved documents and the information that we're, um, and how they can extract information from the stuff. Thanks, Zoe. Um, the One of the great thrills of being in this project, which is very collaborative between historians, archivists, conservators and uh, computer scientists, has been going to Zoe's uh, conservation lab and watching her do some of this amazing work. And as Zoe is pointing out, the repairing and the cleaning of the, the salad documents, these few really survi surviving fragments from the, from the fire of 1922, um, this has kind of liberated, opened the door to older histories. So here by cleaning one document, this is one we found uh, back in 2019, um, that uh, when cleaned, the yeomanry were the volunteer uh, force, like a, a, a home guard of the 1798 period, who were local uh, volunteers helping to suppress United Irish Rebellion and earlier Irish Rebellion against English rule in Ireland. But here you have a list of the pay, the pay dockets for these yeomanry from County Carlow uh, in the southeast of the country. And over on the right hand side, where they're meant to sign their name for their pay chit for the week, you see um, shot for disaffection, deserted, deserted. Uh, dismissed for disaffection and shot for disaffection. So we're seeing yeomanry. Uh, so the, the the we're getting a deeper understanding through conservation of the sort of detail of what's happening in 1798. So this is a centenary project, but it's opening the door to a much deeper history by really finding the history sort of artifacts that are there. So we're hugely excited by this sort of ability to drill deeper. Um, Beyond the wonderful uh, 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 sound records, which are so engaging, our job then beyond 2022 is to try and find copies or transcripts of any records that were in the record office in 1922, uh, any pre-22 copies or transcripts anywhere around the world. We began thinking we might find some small scraps. Now our problem is one of scale. We're finding so much stuff that was copied, either duplicates made at the original time or certified copies, scholars, notes, later copies for administrative reasons. And we're finding these all over the place. One example that's kind of key for us are this idea of para replacements. So imagine you have the Dublin office of the civil service department and it's creating letters for centuries and sending them off to London and London is writing back to Dublin. All the letters into Dublin are burnt in 1922, but all the letters that Dublin sent out to London survive in the National Archives UK, or indeed sometimes survive in Prony or other, other repositories around Britain and Ireland. Those ones weren't technically in the building on the day of the fire, but they can tell us all about the records that were lost in the fire. So these power replacements, we hunt these down and we use them to digitally reconstruct the types of records that were on the shelves. By happy coincidence, while we were doing the work on our project, an EU-funded project, the REGE Consortium, developed Transcribus, which is an automated handwritten text recognition software. And what we're discovering in a lot of our archival work with collaboration with the archivists is manuscript records. These are very expensive to digitize and transcribe, but this computer can now read, you can train it to read all sorts of handwriting and it can do, uh, it can automatically process up to about 85% accuracy. So enough to make a manuscript volume searchable by name, by place name or person name anyway, so it'll index a volume for you. And we're finding that we're getting um, hundreds of thousands of documents and millions, many millions of words of records that are being recovered. All of this has been put into a virtual record, a virtual reconstruction of the building. So this is a building that nobody alive has been inside the record treasury itself. It was destroyed 100 years ago. And um, this has three benefits. One, it engages a new type of audience with history. So bringing your audience to uh, uh, historical research through an anniversary event. 
the computer scientists really like it because it allows them to play with a new computer science environment for research in the virtual reality environment but also it allows us as historians to understand physically because we know what shelves all these records sat on how the archivists conceived of the operations of the state and how the use of the English state in Ireland uh, uh, was structured through through its archival uh, construction. Um, we're finding that the, the challenges are all, the main challenges actually are computer science challenges. We have modern archival hierarchies as in how things are organized in an archive today, how they should be organized. We're getting material from lots of different repositories. Some are modern archives, some are libraries. We've got to reflect their archival reference and hierarchical system and our system and the old Victorian system that was in use in the destroyed building and to make all these gel together in a kind of a concordance. So this is quite a, quite a trick. And then making the computer graph, we're digitizing all of these words, these 50 million words plus each word, each name is being turned into an item, an entity in a knowledge graph that will allow us to drill deeply into the history and see connections that the human eye could never actually see across across the seven centuries of Irish history. Um, and then the challenge for the future, where we're funded up to the end of December 2023. We're currently in delicate negotiations, but the state knows that the, the project has to run on and survive on. So our project now is we've we've found so much stuff we can't get to it all in time for the centenary. So the centenary just becomes a launch point for further action, which we think is all to the good going deeper into history. So I'll stop sharing at that point and hand back over to you, Claire. Thank you. Absolutely marvellous. Um, thank you. And that uh, just the sense of how many different layers of, of structure and systems that you're trying to put together there is just is extraordinary. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, we're going to have um, some sort of broader discussion around some key questions that I'm going to ask the panellists to address. Um, and while we're doing that, please put your questions um, in the chat. I know some of you have done that already. Um, and also um, there'll be a space for people to um, use the raise hand function to ask questions in through with their own voice, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so let's start with some of the broader questions. And here I'd just like um, each of the panelists in whichever order they want to go to perhaps just, just, just see whether they have thoughts. Um, I mean, the questions that I've got are really about kind of um, difficulties. And I don't want to be too negative in this respect, because I also want to think about possibilities. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, around, I mean, all of these projects have inclusion and the involvement of diverse particip participants kind of at, at their heart. And I'm wondering if we can um, tease out um, some of the ways in which this worked best and some of the ways in which it doesn't work. Um, so that perhaps for those of us who are trying to do our own projects around um, diverse audience, we can kind of think with um, the challenges that you have faced. Um, so I don't know who would like to go first um, in addressing that. I don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, I suppose really the real difficulty for us, because we were looking at migration and there's so many different communities and so many individuals, you know, and you can't assume everyone in the community thinks the same way and you can't, you know, no one, two people think the same. So actually trying to do um, a very generic approach isn't always going to be that pleasing to everybody. And, and you do have to do generalizations and assumptions and that's, that's not always ideal. Um, we were very rushed to start with. The project was late because of some of the issues I flagged at the beginning. And then because of COVID, and I was actually very ill and I was off for three months, so that made us even more late. So we had to rush. And again, that's not ideal. So when it comes to something like putting up a plaque on a monument, where ideally you'd have done a really long piece of work around community consultation, it ends up being a, a very small piece and you end up talking to 25 people and actually you'd like to talk to 25,000. So really it the, the real problems is is having to go on assumptions and having to work on your instincts and of course your own instincts are prejudiced. I mean you'll guess from my name that there is a history of migration within my family but you know I come from a very privileged background and and you know I don't don't require much empathy for how I was brought up. So you know you you 
you're, you're coming to it with your own perceptions and prejudices and, and bias and privileges. And, and, that, and that's a problem as well. So really to, to do these things really well takes a lot of time and a lot of investment. And I think that's a challenge. So I think you just kind of have to accept at some point that you do the best you can and, and you go in with open hearts and open minds and, and hope people come to. And that's why it's really important to let people tell their own stories, I think. So for us, that opportunity through the Heritage Grant was excellent that we could give grants and platforms. And we really supported those people as well. It wasn't just a case of giving them money, you know, the great support from the team to enable them to make their projects happen and support for them to keep going forward to make those projects bigger and, and better. Thanks, Kurt. And I want to come back to funding later on. There's a question in the chat about funding. And I think questions around how that shapes projects are really interesting. Um, the rest of the panel, would you like to come in on this one? Keith. Thanks. Um, yeah, for us, so Living Legacy has got funding in 2014. I know we're not going to talk about funding right now. But uh, the reason I mention that is because we entered into a really busy landscape um, and suddenly like we parachuted, that's how it felt to me, we sort of parachuted into um, a whole busy landscape of various projects. And, and your question really about the challenge really about working uh, with community groups and uh, thinking about questions about diversity and inclusion what we found fairly quickly, uh, learning on our feet, so to speak, was engaging with those existing projects and partnerships uh, was absolutely critical. For example, in Belfast, there was one called East Belfast and the Great War. Uh, Jason Burke had been working already, funded by National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, with community groups in East Belfast, looking at newspapers. Um, and interesting people around the impact of the First World War on Belfast, East Belfast. So, you know, working in partnership with Jason was really obviously quite critical. Another project in, in uh, the northeast of England um, was the Northumbria First World War commemoration project, which was already up and running. Um, and we were able to partner with that project to create a new project with Northumbria University on Ge Geordie soldiers in Dominion armies. Um, funded through Living Legacies and NLHF as well. So it was really you know, trying to tap into those networks very early on um, and entering into that sort of dialogue, that conversation was really, we found really important and building trust. And it took a, lot, a long time to build trust. Understandably, universities aren't always trusted. We must, we must recognize that we're getting better. I think the impact agenda is having some impact on that actually. But um, building those, building that trust, building those partnerships and not sort of um, trying to sort of steal a march, you know, so I'm saying we want to work together, co-production, Claire, you mentioned that word. It was very much about co-production. It wasn't about us stealing stuff and running away and getting, you know, publications out of it. It was about, you know, building that trust and partnership, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other panellists, would you like to... Um, Karen. Um, I think the for, for us on Beyond 2022, our sort of co-producing bodies, if you like, are the, the other archives, and they're not all state level archives. Some are quite small organizational archives, very often run by volunteers. So while we're not dealing straight with the like grassroots community, but it's an element within the, who see themselves as part of their community, and sometimes I've dealt with archivists of like religious communities and these sort of things as well, that these people are very protective of the, the the goods and they are goods that they have. They, I think Keith is right, they don't always trust people parachuting in from outside um, and building up the trust. For us, what was a huge help to us was that our funding, which comes from the Irish state, is posited on the fact that the ultimate thing we're producing is free to the end user. And once we could assure that, because I think people have been bitten perhaps by other mass digitization projects from remain, groups that shall remain nameless, but building up that trust, like, so a lot of like my time uh, day to day in the project, uh, I, mean, I entered it as a historian, but an awful lot of it, sorry, before I was in history, I worked in commerce uh, in, the, in the business sector. And a lot of it was about uh, client relationship management, which sounds really business speak, but it feels like that. And they're meeting people genuinely and sometimes just having a cup of coffee and getting them to understand we're not the enemy. And 
asking for their expertise because they know about the stuff that we're talking about and saying, can we have your expertise? And this is how we're thinking of presenting it. Does that look right to you? Does this reflect your work correctly? And then saying, oh, your work, your, your small archive in one region fits in really nicely with something in Prony in Belfast, which is a huge archive. And these things link together really important. So what you have is more important than what you thought it was. So, but and it's all under your name. So that's sort of building, uh, amplifying, amplifying their work, I suppose, and building up trust on that basis, I think has been important for us. And we didn't know until halfway through that that's what we were doing. <laughs> But that's what we were doing. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, Stephen, did you want to say anything about your project in relation to this? Yeah, I think um, there's something to be said about the size and scale of the organisation that you're representing and working for. Um, you know, as I mentioned briefly in my presentation, Egan Museum is not the biggest museum, um, and it has many limitations from that in with that regard but if there is one real positive that comes from that it's agile or it can be agile uh, and also it is very um innocuous it's unthreatening um people around us in the local community on you know surprisingly felt great kind of pride um in sort of the magna carta anniversary and it was kind of a moment in which the community could come together um, and, you know, the, the museum, you know, positioned itself as a uh, kind of conduit to, to enable other people um, to, to speak together and work together. Um, and it wasn't, and we weren't, we weren't trying to take, um, you know, to, to take their activities away from them. In fact, it, it was actually, look, we just want to, we've got this money, we've got this project, we would like to use this as a platform to provide exposure for all of the wonderful things that local community groups are doing. And, and I think, I think that, you know, the reality is that actually some sometimes larger organisations don't are, you know, there's a there's a lot more kind of cynicism that is um, that, that comes from larger organisations um, trying to be philanthropic, but sometimes people don't like that, do they? I knew I'd do that at some point in this session. So there you go, I've done it, I'll probably do it again. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, I have some other broader questions that I, I would like to hear responses from the panel, but I'm also aware that questions are coming in and I don't want um, us all to, to miss out the opportunity. So perhaps we'll, and I'm aware that there are at least two hands raised, so I see your hands and I will come to you. Um, but I would, I think I'd like to go to the question around um, funding. Um, this is a question from um, Bridget Blankley. Um, Bridget, do you want to read, do you want to say your own question or are you happy for me to um, read it? I'll presume you're happy for me to read it. Um, unless you say otherwise, please read. So um, a general question, it appears that these projects have grown or wandered away from their original remit to some extent. How does this impact on funding, which is usually quite closely tied to the original funding bid? And I was struck, particularly in Katerina's um, first presentation, around the loss of funders. So I'm quite interested in the material context for these projects and the constraints that the funding landscape and particular funders might place on what we do. Um, and I open that up to whoever wants to take it first. Shall I go again? Sing Please. Yes, thank you, Katarina. I mean, actually, it was, um, we, we didn't really basically have a huge problem with that because we designed the way the project was going before we made the funding applications. So we're a big chunk of money, £279,000 from the Arts Council and £98,000 from the Heritage Fund. And those applications are very much written with the view to taking this approach to the anniversary. And actually the, the Heritage Fund really likes some of the work we're doing. So we did, and we made an ESOL resource, for instance, so that people could learn heritage language, refugee groups we were working with learn heritage language. So, so we really, you know, in a way we really played to their objectives of those funding bodies. Um, the, the sponsor, 
that left, I think partly left because of some of the difficulties in the anniversary moving, transitioning from one thing to the other. But I think their expectations had been very much around a certain type of programme, which they, they didn't feel we would be delivering in this new way. And I think a lot more of that is to do with understanding about what arts and culture can and is and, and what it should be, you know, and, and people <laughs> thinking how cheap it is to deliver arts programs. You know, I, I think there was there was an expectation that for um for not very much money we could put on huge scale events, which we just couldn't. So I think some of that was really around expectations and and probably didn't manage those very well. And a lot of that goes back to my earlier point about that rush. You know, actually we made a big change very quickly overnight uh, and people had been quite comfortable and happy in one direction and then it just came in and so uh, some of that really probably was about poor communication as much as anything else and uh, and actually some bloody mindedness <laughs> on my part of just charging through so I think really it, it wasn't very it wasn't a melodrama around that but I, th I think it was literally around understanding um and actually, as time went on, you know, halfway through our anniversary, Black Lives Matter happened and, and lots of people then suddenly it, it, the pennies dropped and, and, and things fell into place. And suddenly everybody was the champion of what we'd done. <laughs> there was a big kind of mass conversion halfway through for people who hadn't really liked the direction when they suddenly realised you know, just how difficult those anniversaries could be. I think people hadn't genuinely understood how difficult these stories could be to other communities and I don't think we spent the time well I know we didn't have the time we didn't spend the time getting them to understand that thank you uh, Kieran uh, just briefly on on the funding question and the idea of moving away from the core thing that you fun got funded maybe we've done well by the fact that we are based in university because we've always positioned this as a research project and we've said well, research by its nature has an indeterminate, I mean, you have a broad area of expertise and a broad area of activity, but you can't determine the actual outcome. And we kept repeating that all the time to the state funding body. And they bought that, uh, I'm sorry, bought that sounds like we sold them a pup, but <laughs> they, they understood that. <laughs> sorry, this is not being recorded. Yes, it is. Um, but uh, no, they understood that. And we've constantly fed that back to me each quarterly report and saying, look, the research is leading in this way. And with this is the way we're going to pursue. So there's no surprises. And they get quarterly updates saying we're moving in this direction and it gives them comfort. But so, but I think a non-university project or a pure, you are a local group doing a heritage anniversary thing is more tightly constrained. The university has a bit of liberal sort of stretch on the research world, I think. Keith or Stephen, did you or Zoe, did you did you have, have anything think, thinking about this funding issue and how it might have framed you? Yeah, um, I would say they, um, well, I mean, Keith's right in, in the sense that there are, and the question is right in the sense that there is obviously limitations and constraints into where the money goes. But, um, you know, once you're rewarded money, it, it there is a you know, there is negotiation, not negotiation, but there is movement. Um, for instance, if a certain amount of your, your foreseen activity um, isn't having the impact uh, that it that it, that you thought it would, um, you know, funders are open to to moving um, money and pots around because ultimately they want the money used in the best possible way. Um, and I think another thing actually is that uh, yes, what the you know what Egan Museum was able to produce was far greater than what we uh what ninety eight thousand pounds could have done but part of that was actually that we were able to use the initial grant from a very well-established recognized um, institution to then go to other smaller funders for top up um or uh, to have kind of auxiliary activities associated to so we're already doing this we've got the money to do this we would like to add this um and, and that was really a very effective uh, way of kind of widening the scope um, and approach of the project, um, but also kind of being true to the to the initial kind of funding constraints and and, and kind of deliverables for each. Thanks, Stephen. Keith, do you want to I mean, I suppose our, our feeling with Living Legacies is that always that we could do more together 
Um, so really, although we had core funding, which was fantastic, that, and that in effect enabled us to um, engage with um, our co-investigators and so on and so forth and have a certain kind of university infrastructure behind us, but that wasn't going to pay for everything. I just did a quick check and, you know, we, we were supporting 120 community projects. So our core funding couldn't support that. But by working in collaboration with those community groups, they were then able to go to National Lottery Heritage Fund, for example, and apply for a first award, then a now uh, project and get funding. And then we could come in on, on, on uh, alongside them uh, with that project, with that funding and stretch it. So, in that, so it gave us that kind of capacity to go a little bit beyond our core funding, which is just keeping the show on the road really for six years. But then this, this additional kind of unlocking of funding was a really important way of getting these sort of projects up and, up and running, the, the smaller community-based grassroots type projects. And I think the AHRC were, were, were quite clever, really. Um, I don't know if anyone was listening from the AHRC, but uh, the way they organised this, so we had two tranches of funding, one the first for three years, then a the second for another three years. And within those core funds, there were funds which were allocated or ring fence for co-production projects. And we as, as living legacies then had to, in effect, kind of outsource some of our projects. Some of those projects were developed by groups outside living legacies, but working as part and funded through living legacies. So I think that worked pretty well, actually. It made us, it gave us that ability to get to stretch um, our networks and stretch the funding and get that elasticity in there to keep it moving. But I think this back to the mentioned. It's really important that when we get the ending of our finite funds and funds always will come to an end, is that we have a plan for what follows and we don't just in effect walk away or close the door, whatever metaphor you want to use, that we maintain the conversation, the dialogue, even though the core funding may have stopped the living legacies, living legacies hasn't stopped. You know, so we, we need, and I think universities recognize that, but we know we need to make sure that the money does kind of continue to be to be given a kind of granted to us in one way or another, as academics, I mean, to maintain that conversation. Thank you, Kitty. Zoe, have you got anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, th I think in terms of the funding that we got for the from the IMC, in terms of that conservation project, um, what we did with that, it was a small pot of funding and what was important to us was constant engagement throughout that conservation survey with the funders um, and letting people know what was happening as progress as it progressed. And from our point of view, that was key because because of that engagement, I mean, so we set up um, it was a project conservator and a photographer, and we kind of set up even something as simple as weekly tweets, sort of saying this is what we're discovering, this is what we found. Um, and that really worked and in terms of letting the funders know that um, their money was being well spent and the results, and we kept it tight. It was a 16 week um, project for the survey. And um, because we'd worked really hard at that engagement, because we kept our deadlines, it then meant when they came back, they were so enthusiastic. They said, well, would you like some more money? What else could you do with it? So we were successful then in getting a second pot of money, which enabled us to do that first tranche of conservation. Um, and perhaps it's something that conservators aren't very skilled at doing that kind of level of engagement and um, we tend to just like to focus on our documents and our objects um, but it was actually really critical and really key and just and that's maintained over the course of the because we're, we're about four years into the project now um, and we've, we've maintained that um, and continue to do that so I think that's key as well to making sure the funders know where their money's going the value for the for money as well um, and and just making sure that they can see results and that there's transparency there um, and openness. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, now, we're, I've got three hands up. At least I can see three. I'll, I'll keep checking to see as more go up. Um, so, can I take the question from um, Arif uh, Zalman? Thank you. Hello. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, for taking the the, the question. Um, congratulations on your arrival at IHR as well. Um, I, I, just a question about um, really. My question was about the diaspora engagement um, with two um, two sort of points here to connect to. One is the the point around the World War One um, um, anniversary. I mean the um, the, uh, the various World War One living legacies. To what extent? Um, there was diaspora en uh, engagement. I'm very struck by, you know, for example, many Muslims visit the Brookwood Cemetery 
um, there is a very a lot of Muslim graves there, but none of them, very few of them, ever reflect on walking across the other side to the Commonwealth War Graves. So there is a real disconnect at the community level in that connection. I'd be interested in, in that dimension. Also on the Irish um, National Archives, there's obviously this incredibly diverse and, and um, amazing diaspora the Irish diaspora has, and to what extent they figured in your in your plans and in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Keith, do you want to start with that? Yeah, brilliant. Great questions. Yeah, thanks, sir. Um, from the living, living legacies perspective, um, the way in which diaspora really began, began to be something which we can engage with was through a project in the Northwest uh, with the Northwest Migrant Forum. Um, which we were, again, this was a co-production um, project, um, to open up different kinds of voices around the First World War, um, which took us away from these, from these islands, um, but more in a kind of contemporary diaspora, you know, mi migrant voices sort of perspective. The, the more from what, I think what you were mentioning earlier on, um, reminded me quite a lot of what Ian Grosvenor, there were five engagement centres, and Ian Grosvenor at the uh, University of Birmingham, his centre was called Voices of War and Peace, and that was very much interested in engaging with diasporic communities and, and migration stories around the First World War. So I think, again, these engagement centres were quite clever in the way they've been set up, really, because they could each sort of play to their strengths um, in, in different parts of the country. So. But for us, the Northwest Migrants Forum especially was to begin to open up a more kind of complicated view of the First World War. And in some cases, actually enabling community groups to explore parts of their past, which actually they had not really explored, which was, I thought was really good. Thanks, Keith. Um, any other members of the panel want to chip in, Kieran? Just on the Irish one, sorry to mm -hmm. keep hugging in on every, every question, sorry, Claire. Um, the, uh, that question of diaspora, uh, we have what we're talking about now within the project as a documentary diaspora. So the amount of Irish records that went with Irish people, but it's interesting, the what well, we're tracing are state records. So it's the English government in Ireland. So it's a particular type of record, uh, not entirely representative of the entire national experience, if you like. But there's a surprising amount of records, copies of things that would have perhaps been taken back by, say, English governors in Ireland going back to their home states in England. These papers later get sold off on the open market and end up being bought by some US library or something. So it's a very strange spread of where things have ended up. And we're finding materials in the oddest of locations. But uh, certainly Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, we're finding records that are state related or tell us something about the state records. In Europe, which we've been busily looking at some of the great uh, sort of European archives and sort of Spanish, Italian, and French archives, um, but they tend to be cultural Irish records as opposed to state records. So these are the Irish Gaelic diaspora who would have left in the early modern period, taking a different type of record with them. So that's just as a general field so far, but certainly it's something we're, we're actively chasing down and are in, in sort of detailed discussions with the the documentary diaspora, if you like, through their archives around the world. Yeah, but it is it's fascinating to see the follow that trail. Yeah, thank you. Zoe, did you want to add to that? I think pretty much Kieran has captured it as exactly as Ari asked the question. I kind of wrote down documents of the diaspora. It's like their dispersal all, all around the, um, the world, which is fascinating. I think the key to the project has also been harping back to that collaborative um, sort of partnership and the fact that for the first time, this project is getting the, the the National Archives in London, in Northern Ireland and Ireland working together on a key project. The fact that now the engagement with it um, is has gone to the, the, the wider local and county archive level as well. I mean, that's what's truly fascinating and unique, um, I think, about this project. Um, but yeah, no, definitely, it's the documents that have disappeared everywhere. But then, you know, that also then just means the the engagement with it on on the platform um, is huge uh, on the worldwide um, audience. is really is really huge as well, which is fantastic. Thank you, um, Stephen or Katerina, do you have do you want to add to this? It, it's not. It's okay if you don't. Okay, um, we've got a comment in the chat there from Karen B. 
Um, a lot of Heritage Lottery Fund World War One community projects were in diaspora communities, but fewer worked with academics. One of the challenges is perceptions of universities and the time it takes to build relationships and trust, as Keith said, and I was certainly very struck by the question of trust in this, and it seems like all of our panellists were. Um, we have a question from Pippa. Hi. Um... I suppose it's uh, building on from the conversations that, uh, that's been taking place about the role of the diaspora. And uh, some of this I'm going to talk about in the afternoon, or I should say later on in the evening. But I think what strikes me is particularly because I work on divided histories, looking at the partition of um, South Asia is how much of the politics of the homeland then feeds into the diaspora and not to think about diasporas as these homogenous units anymore, because actually there's a lot of communalized politics and then particularly in a place like Leicester where I'm based, um, you know, there's, uh, we've seen that come across in a really powerful way um, in terms of how which voices actually manage to come to the fore. And so in thinking about the community, which community people participate, which ones don't, perhaps whose voices are being heard, are they the gatekeepers or the guardians of the community? So actually it's, it, it's much more problematic in terms of trying to speak for everyone in the community. And I think we have to recognize that any project is not going to reflect everything that the community wants it to reflect because there'll always be disjointed voices. And I know there's particularly one project that's going on at the moment, I won't mention uh, the project itself, but they've encountered many of these difficulties in terms of, you know, when we talk about partition, in Britain from the diaspora perspective, how, how do you overcome these challenges? Um, and I suppose in a sense, you know, when we talk about community projects, working with academics, uh, you know, it, it, I've not been able to find the combination. Um, I don't know if there is a magic combination for this. Um, so this is from the kind of, you know, from the other side as opposed to the kind of, uh, from the community uh, project side. I mean, excellent point. Um, Katerina, you were nodding along. Do you want to respond to that? Well, I think it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. It's just, you can't represent everybody and that's, and that's really hard. And, you know, people, there were lots of different problems also with the Mayflower anniversary. So obviously there was the Native American problem. And then there was the problem around the foundation of America, and then the, that led on to the slave trade. So there was lots of people in the community that were very angry from the slavery angle, but weren't then necessarily interested in looking at Native American slaves and only wanted to look at slavery from a particular, you know, from the, the African experience. So it's just, it is very, very hard. And uh, you, you just can't, and you have to, well, as a programmer, as a creative person, you have to kind of just really know what you can deliver and deliver a well. And I think that's that's also some way where you can fall down a hole. If you do try to please, you're never going to please everybody. So if you try to, you're going to end up pleasing nobody really. So I think that's just why it's very important to get people to, to speak for themselves because that's, you know, that's genuinely authentic and relevant to whoever's doing the speaking and just creating as many opportunities as you can for as many people to speak as you can really but no it's it's impossible and you know it's awful when you try to take that middle road because everyone's disgruntled thank you so anybody of the panelists want to respond to that question okay um i mean uh, the, the creative approaches and how they can actually be a real tool um uh, for offering for speaking to diverse communities, but also difference within communities um, really struck me across the papers, actually. Um, so the next question is um, Sophie, Sophie, Sophie Vora. 
Um, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you very much. That was such a, an interesting um, panel. Um, I have a question. So I myself work on um, commemoration. I looked at um, the commemorative history of, of uh, the British railway industry. And I, I suppose this is something that I've been grappling with myself in terms of my own research. Um, and I wanted the thoughts of, of the kind of uh, panel on this. And, and I suppose it's it's the kind of larger concept of anniversaries being a springboard for, you know, kind of much needed actions, be they kind of social, cultural, economic um, within academia. Um, and this idea that you have to sort of um, it, it's a time when you can prove the relevance and celebrate your identity or the value of, of heritage and, and make tangible outputs um, lot, usually quite expensive um, and then alongside that within academia you know being able to say my my research is important now because it fits within this kind of anniversary conversation um, and I suppose the kind of broader question or the thing that I'm asking here is and, and, I, and I don't really expect a distinct answer on this it's more a kind of thought exercise I guess is um, whether we could actually have the same impact um, by getting all these communities to work together and academic research, uh, research funding if we didn't have these anniversaries as the base of why we are relevant like I, I always find that so difficult to to sort of riddle out in my head because I don't think there's anything that's really pushed as hard as anniversary based events to bring so many amazing things together um so yeah I would very much welcome some some thoughts on that another really really brilliant question um Kevin you're nodding do you want to start with that well, it's sort of you only get presents on your birthday, although your family love you all the time. <laughs> um, but the the uh, no, I I, I would grapple with the same thing. Like uh, on our team, on the certainly on the historians side of our, of our project, you're looking at the anniversary and saying, well, this material is just as important last year and next year. Why is it so? But it, I mean, being completely bloody minded about it, it's that it gives a deadline for the funders. We can go, we would go to, go to funders and say, you must fund it this year. And we've got 24 months to do it because by then it'll be ready for this deadline. Otherwise they can say, yeah, yeah that might be important in another budget round or something like that. So I don't know whether we as academics have created the hunger for anniversaries or are we responding to a public hunger for anniversaries? But the very moment we get the funding by the anniversary, we say, aha, it's really important because it opens the door to something else entirely. So it's going back to the question about mission creep or scope creep or whatever. But um, yeah, it's uh, in a way, it's the environment that the public seem to like. And um, but but I think I'm going right back to something. I think uh, that um, the very first uh, uh, Katrina said in a very first presentation, I think that people are definitely open, the public are open to complex and complicated and contested histories. And if an anniversary gets them, they come to an anniversary thing because it's got a big neon light on it. But once you get them in the door, you can say, aha, but there's three different ways of looking at this. And then also there's your way, what do you think? And I think the public definitely engage with that, if, although the funders may not always see that coming down the line at them, but I think the public love it. So I, I accept the anniversaries as a, a necessary evil and just use them as best we can. I don't know, it's a bit of a thought experiment, I like that idea. <laughs> I, I suppose just to chip in on that, uh, if you think about a lot of the anniversaries that we're dealing with, and even the title of the, of the conference, they're traumatic events. And so they have, um, that's coming up a lot for us at the minute, um, just with certain histories that are going on at the minute, the trauma that, 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 that surrounds these, that there wasn't the space for the dialogue to happen in, in a safe way. And we've got to that point now. And again, a bit like that, if, if it does take a period of time. Um, and it's fantastic that for some of these anniversaries, there are still descendants or there are, are you know, mainly it's descendants who, who are or immediate descendants who are still around. But but it's it's that, that space for them. And I, I fully agree with Kieran. Um, it, it is like getting getting that key point and, and that date as a, almost as a springboard, you know, leading up to it and then once it happens, don't let it don't let it dissipate. Don't let it go on. And I think 
nothing more says that than the title of the project beyond 2022. Um, we don't see this stopping any of us and never have um, on the 30th of June 19, or 2022. And it is now, which is, is, is actually, but even getting that concept into funders' I, uh, psyche almost of saying, well, you know, this, and, and Keith talked about the living legacies and the legacies that need to go on as well. So I, I think that's, yeah, it's definitely something, it, the platform has to be there, but the space to have that safe dialogue about traumatic events is, is really key. Um, yeah, I would agree around, I mean, funders like them and the public like them. And I was I was just, someone put a comment about the media and it just reminded me, when we did Parliament, we had so many anniversaries in 2015. So you had Magna Carta, the Simon de Montfort Parliament, Agincourt, Waterloo, the death of Churchill, the 1965 Race Relations Act. And I had to come up with a programme for all of them. And it was, um, it was a huge, <laughs> it was about half a million pounds worth of stuff delivered across the whole country, schools resources, national archives, fantastic new online resource around Magna Carta, the stuff you've heard from Stephen, um, just fantastic program. And the Daily Mail, of course, were at our press conference. And the first thing they said is, but you're not doing anything for VE Day, that's 70 years. <laughs> they had to pick the anniversary, of course, we weren't doing it. And there is just this kind of, that's the real problem with anniversaries is, is which ones do you pick a, as well? And I think, really are so for us in the sector are in it, it's finding those anniversaries which really are useful for us and where we can say something new and interesting. And I wouldn't really be interested in looking at anniversary that that we couldn't say anything new with. I'll be working on a, a less troubling one next year. I'm working on the, working with the women's football with UEFA on the women's Euros. And it's also the 50th anniversary of the, the Lionesses next year, which would you think was a really celebratory anniversary, but of course, it's trouble for the FA because it's only 50 years because they banned them in 1921. So the FA is having to celebrate kind of its own, its own uh, downfalls as well as its reinstation. So, but actually, you know, there's another great opportunity to talk about how that story of women's football aligns to social and political emancipation of women, etc. So I think as long as we we use them well, they they are a great tool and a great hook. Thank you. And um, yes, Sean's point, Sean O'Connell's point in the chat. I like the idea of um, a survey of research applications demonstrating the impact of impact. Uh, so uh, maybe somebody's going to do that. Um, there are lots of comments in the chat. I, th I, I don't think I've missed any questions, but please feel free to prompt me um, if I have. Did any of the other panelists, Keith, do you want to come in on the... Um, the sort of why anniversaries question. Yeah, I do actually, because I mean, I'm not a historian, okay? I'm a geographer. And uh, I was slightly, initially, to be honest, I was slightly perplexed by this fixation <laughs> with dates. And it seemed to me, um, dare I say, almost reductive. You know, we'd want to try and complicate the past and to think about connection, fluidities, mobilities. And yet reducing history to date seems to me like chronology. You know, it's about a series of points. Um, on a time on a timeline, so it's like it did it did trouble me actually, and and you know, kind of conceptually I suppose, uh, analytically. But having said that, I do recognise they are really useful hooks um, for us to to um, to connect with and to hang off. Um, and I think certainly there's there's always a compelling argument around timeliness, especially putting together uh, research applications. Um, and trying to tap into, you know, what people are actually maybe interested in a particular year, particular anniversary. And I've just got funding from, again, the AHRC and also the Irish Research Council for a project on the bicentenary of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland. OK, 200, uh, 200th anniversary of the Ordnance Survey on the island of Ireland. OS 200 is the name of the project. And uh, here was me being, uh, I thought, this is a really important anniversary. And then uh, no, we, we need to recognise this. So here's me sort of saying, OK, well, let's kind of use that hook to try and get that resource. I see Kieran nodding, you know, get that resource because we want to see this anniversary. We want to see it kind of explored in inter and hopefully interesting kinds of ways. The World War One was slightly different, I think, because as a as a centenary set of anniversaries, it was always going to be something which was pretty much state sponsored. You know, it was always going to be these really big um, state sponsored events around key dates. 
um, like Armistice and so on. So I think that was going to happen, that kind of bigger kind of landscape um, of, of anniversaries. And I think what's nice about anniversaries is that we kind of localize them, we ground them, we bring them down, you know, to what they might mean to localities and to places, which is what Katerina was taught. You know, for that, it's really interesting to be able to do that, is to kind of bring it, bring those kind of big global dates down to the local scale. I really like that. I also like the circle of anniversaries of anniversaries of anniversaries, which is quite compelling. Stephen, I was struck in your, in your presentation, you, you used the term heritage, you talked about heritage tourism, really. And I kind of wonder the extent to which you have that sense of anniversaries as being central or, or, or impossible to pull out of heritage um, tourism. Um, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, you know, I, I've been mulling over Sophie's challenge to us all and um, it, it, to be fair it's fried my mind um <laughs> there's one part of me that that is uh completely kind of uh you know just flawed and flattened like yeah you're right we're just part of the problem aren't we um and the other part of me is is hearing all of the positives that spring from anniversaries and the energy and the action and um and and yeah there is yeah, we've all said it in various forms um you know the the money that comes with anniversaries is undoubtedly the reason why the activity happens um and i suppose i suppose from my perspective yes there are lots of every moment in history is, is worthy of um, research is worthy of being spoken about is important to you know big groups small groups individuals um but but ultimately, you need to have something. Uh, you need to have marketed in a way to which your project can gain the resource to get it in the shop window of the public. Um, if we are talking, you know, more broadly about you know engagement with public and not just you know academics. Um, so yes, it is. It is uh, sadly a bit depressing um but it but it but it is also you know, there's nothing wrong with embracing it and playing the game is there because there's a lot that we can benefit from by you know playing playing the game and abiding by the rules we might not like the rules we might not like the game but uh, at the moment it is kind of the position that we've arrived in and until we collectively turn around and say you know what we're not interested in round number anniversaries anymore we want to talk about the things that we don't talk about every day uh, as a collective then this is what we're going to be what we're going to be doing and maybe that's a bit of a somber note <laughs> but I sad it's probably it's probably the reality isn't it and until there's a cultural shift in how we think about time and its connection to the present then that's what we're going to be doing i mean there's a couple thanks thanks Stephen. and there's a couple of comments um in the chat that kind of take that and you know emphasize the positives as well. That um, I mean, um, Karen B anniversaries, as a number of you have said, great catalysts um, for people and, and keeping the relationships going. And we've already seen this commitment to the legacy um, of the activities, and also Caitlin White there. Um, but you know, again, speaking to this idea that we get the funding at a moment, but then we do so much more with it. Um, so it's a mechanism and a tool and a, and a useful tool. Um, I'm just looking, I've got a question here um, from Kieran Wallace. Can I ask Keith how big a problem was the clash of different thinking about anniversaries, e.g. US notions of Magna Carta versus current UK England analysis of Magna Carta? So that should be um, Stephen, clear. Sorry, sorry, that is Stephen, Stephen. yes. That's Stephen. That's, sorry, um, wrong name. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> so I'm just, <laughs> when they collided, on the same field, Stephen. Um, yeah, so uh, an interesting one, um, and I'm sure Katarina also has, you know, is welcome to to, to provide her insights. Um, I think, by and large, actually, getting people in Britain to be interested in democratic heritage is a is an uphill task and struggle. Um, for some reason, we have an ambivalence to that side of our history. Um, if it's not Henry VIII and royalty and monarchy, then 
uh, you know, palaces, etc., then then that doesn't seem to to fly to the same regard. Whereas, you know, our American cousins, um, whether that's because of you know the the codified nature of the Declaration of Independence and and the way that it uh, was birthed through uh, sort of um, you know that that long history and influence of Magna Carta in, in in the creation of that, they actually do have more of a uh, a claim, a, a contemporary grasp, uh, a, a hook, and and see its re- importance, um, you know, and, and have more of a reverence to it. That being said, of course, um, those people on the field at Runnymede on Monday, the fifteenth June, twenty fifteen, they they were probably the most engaged. Um, in Magna Carta, i.e., these were the you know the commemorators. These were the ones that had had driven a, a large proportion of uh, state um, commemorative activity, um, and so there probably was a, a meeting of minds, and that kind of tension wasn't as you know uh, wasn't e- exposed um, to the same degree as if you'd position probably you know some people from say. Bolton um, <laughs> with some people, um, you know, with some people from the American Bar Institution, you would have seen probably a bit more of a conflict there. Um, but no, you know, there is a, there definitely is a, a, a difference in interpretation and a, a difference with regards to how they see, how they kind of see the importance of it. Um, but of course, like, as I said, for the, for the commemorators, for those or- orchestrating the commemorative, commemorative events, it was you know, a, a you know a, a national a nationally significant moment, um, pivotal to the construction of a national history. Um, you know, a foundational moment almost. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I think I'll leave it there before I rant on anymore. I so I started laughing when you asked the question because there were very many moments on Magna Carta when it was the real sense of the Americans. Not the Americans, that's awful, isn't it? Some of the Americans we are working with wanting a kind of, in my opinion, very Disneyfied view of, um, of what Magna Carta should be. So one one lawyer who turned up, I and mean, he was a White House lawyer, and he turned up and fell asleep at the meeting because he'd literally just flown in. And then woke up and his opinion was, put a knight in every hotel in the country. That's what you got to do. you got to put a knight in every hotel. <laughs> and this was his big kind of suggestion of how we would mark Magna Carta and then actually on running me that day it was there was a very bizarre thing of these knight templars who whoever they were and they they actually looked a lot like kind of Essex bouncers types but they're in these kind of long white cloaks capes I mean they just looked it it did look remarkably similar to a kind of clansman outfit which was just awful and there was this awful moment when they surrounded Loretta Lynch she was the attorney general who came from America and she was surrounded by these rather big beefy men in these it was just so there were real clashes of cultures and the approaches because there was a real sense from some of our American colleagues that they really wanted this kind of over overly historical representation of, of medieval characters and and of course the uh, the people from Temple were actually going mad because these weren't actual Templars and the Templars would be so you have this real clash of the real history versus the thing so there was I kind of think also that for Mayflower, of course, the relationship with the Americans was huge because massive drive behind that program to get Americans to come to the UK. And of course, that couldn't happen anyway because of COVID. But actually, I think it, it drove a lot of how people, I think it was more informing to how people program their work than the funders. So we have questions about what do you have to do to keep the funders happy. But I think a lot of people across the, the National Compact programmed for American tourists. And so did a very particular view of history, which in, in my view was restrictive. You know, I, I didn't, they promised us millions of Americans for Magna Carta, they never came. I knew they weren't gonna come for Mayflower. So actually I, I was liberated in a way by that previous experience of not having to program for American tourists, but actually programming for the people of Southampton which led us to lead a much more authentic and relevant anniversary. Thank you. 
Um, I think, I mean, I really think this could just run and run and it has been just such a delight um, and also intellectually stretching to think about all of these projects and in the same space. So um, I really want to thank all of our panelists for just such engaging um, and, and, and such engaging ways of engaging with the questions. I also want to thank everybody who posed a question. Uh, it was just, it was really great.